Hello YouTubers and fellow hams. Well, things look different. Obviously, I'm not in the RV. I had to fly back to Indiana for medical stuff. Um, don't know how long I'm going to be here, but uh, I'm staying with friends. And one of my f best friends, uh, Rick, he's, he's a ham, but he's also got a nice electronics lab in his basement, even a 3D printer. So I thought I'm going to go ahead and uh, try to do a, a video or two while I'm here. And getting back to the one that I started back in uh, Arizona in the RV, I'm going to build a magnetic loop. A smaller um, magnetic loop designed for hand holding for pedestrian mobile. Uh, I want to try to cover at least 20 meters through 10 meters. And I thought, well, I would do um, a two part video. First off, this one, we're going to talk about how you design a magnetic loop. Uh, the construction of it, uh, where you get the capacitors from, the capacitor from, how you choose the capacitor, how you choose the dimension of the loop based on the frequency you want to cover. Um, I'm just going to go through the whole process of designing the loop. So uh, I, you know, I get these questions all the time on my other mag loop videos. Uh, so let's just go. Let's just get right into it. Let's uh, design a magnetic loop from scratch. So first, I need to decide uh, what frequency range I want to cover. We're going to need to know that. Now, I want to try to get 20 meters through 10 meters. So we'll be talking 14 megahertz um, through 29.7. So once I've got that figured out, now what about the dimension of the loop? Well, the circumference is the, the value that usually you uh, need to know, um, not the diameter. Uh, most of the calculators, like the online calculator we're going to use, uh, works with circumference, which is the distance around the outside of the main loop. Um, so I'm going to be shooting for something around a two-foot diameter, and if we take two times pi, 3.14, to get our circumference, it's just over six feet. Now uh, the same formula works for um, metric measurements too. If you're working in meters, you know, if you're if you're saying like in this case, I want uh, two-thirds of a meter, uh, 0.77 um, of a meter, then you would just take that times pi to get your your circumference. So anyway, uh, which would be, by the way, about two meters. Um, the, uh, the magnetic loop basically is a tank circuit, okay? It's a coil and a capacitor in parallel, which makes a resonant circuit. And it, um, it's resonant at the frequency that you want to operate at, a very narrow, very high Q. And uh, when you're putting power into it, then it, it actually radiates, becomes an antenna. And this is the, ge the physical layout and geometry of the magnetic loop, where you have the outer loop, uh, which you want to have a fairly good conductor, thick, maybe, maybe copper pipe would be the best thing, because you want that to be lowest resistance as possible. Um, and then you've got your coupling loop, which is just a smaller loop, one-fifth, the size of the outer loop is the rule of thumb. So you take whatever dimension on your outer loop and you multiply it by 0 0.2, that's the size of the coupling loop. And then you've got the capacitor at the opposite end of the main loop. The capacitor. That's going to be a different segment in this video talking about the capacitor. First off, let's go to a web calculator that I found and I will show you how you can do some what-ifs to determine the value of the capacitor that you need, uh, the range of the capacitor that you need to cover the frequency range of the loop you're building. Over on 66pacific.com calculators, I found this small transmitting loop antenna calculator, and I really like it. Uh, it requires that we input some data here. We need to know the length of the conductor, the antenna circumference, in feet, so if you're doing this in metric, you'll need to do a little conversion. The diameter of the conductor, uh, which is, you know, how big around or how thick the conductor is in inches. Uh, the frequency that we're targeting. And transmitter input power, optional. Now what this is for is for calculating the voltage across the capacitor. In a magnetic loop, that RF voltage is going to be quite high. So... 
I know from my um, design intention that I want about a two foot diameter loop, so that's going to be about 6.2 feet circumference, which we get at by, by multiplying the diameter by pi. Diameter of the conductor, um, I'm going to be using a thick coax, which I already have measured, and it's about uh, point, point 0.39 inches in diameter. And our target frequency. So our, our lowest target frequency is 14 megahertz, which is at the bottom of 20 meters. And I'm going to put in 5 for the power because I'm not going to be putting in more than 5 watts into this loop. Um, oh, we can use this. Uh, we can go metric here, by the way, English or metric. So I'll, I'm doing this in English, but you could do it in metric right there. So I'm going to hit calculate. And what that's going to do is it's going to give us uh, an estimate of the antenna efficiency, 16%. Bandwidth, um, 25 kilohertz, that's not bad. And to get down to 20 meters to 14 megahertz, we would need to have 149 picofarads for our capacitance. So I'm going to copy that. And here's where we're putting in 5 watts. We're looking at about 455 volts RMS across the capacitor. So the uh, and we're going to have about 5.97 amps of uh, circulating current. So this gives us some nice, some nice data here. But what we're really interested in is this capacitance value because that's the unknown. So my capacitor is going to have to go up to at least 149 picofarads. So I have a document here where I've got my data. So our capacitor high value is going to have to be 149 picofarads. Now, to get to the high frequency that I want to cover, which is going to be 29.7 megahertz, calculate. And for that, our capacitor is going to have to go down to 33 picofarads. And at that higher frequency, we're going to have 113 kilohertz bandwidth. Well, I don't know how they calculate that. It's actually a little narrower than that, but... It's going to be a higher efficiency too, 72% um, up at 10 meters. Uh, so that's good to know. And a 461 volts RMS across the capacitor. This is where plate spacing is important on your capacitor. So mm, most of the uh, ganged tuning capacitors are going to be able to handle that without arcing um, at our low 5 watts here. Okay, so 33 picofarads. That's the low value of my capacitor. So... I need to find a tuning capacitor that can go from at least 149 picofarads when it's fully meshed to 33 picofarads when it's unmeshed. And we're probably going to have to try to find one that exceeds that range a little bit. Um, you want you don't want to be too you don't want to go right precisely to the ends. You want to have a little um, overlap or a little um, headroom on each end. So this is my target range. I need to find a tuning capacitor that can go from 149 picofarads down to 33 picofarads. And that is how you determine what you need for a variable capacitor. Uh, this link for this calculator will be in the video description below, um, or you can just pause the video and write it down here. So now that we've uh, used the web calculator and determined the range of variable capacitor that we need for the loop, where do you find variable capacitors? This is another question I get a lot. Uh, I always keep my eyes out at ham fests. There's always some guy at a ham fest that'll have a box on his table with a bunch of variable capacitors in it. So I always keep my eye out there and I've collected some over the years that way. But as far as sourcing new ones, the best uh, source that I have found has been AliExpress. Uh, the website. Um, most of them come from China, but they have brand new caps, inbox, a whole variety of them. Uh, the only problem is you got to wait a month and a half or two months for shipping. So that's the, the downside there. Um, eBay uh, is another one you can look at. Search on eBay for air variable capacitor and you'll find several. Um, I found one for the loop I'm building on eBay. I uh, got lucky. It was only 20 bucks, so I've got that coming for this loop. Um, so yeah, those are the places you go to look for capacitors. Now, there's another thing I want to talk about with the capacitor. Um, I've seen a lot of people complain about this with like the A loop and the Alex loop, and it is an issue. 
there, the magnetic loop is so sensitive that a change on that capacitor of just a couple of picofarads is going to shift it in kilohertz in frequency. So when you reach in with your hand to tune the loop, your hand getting into the proximity of the capacitor changes its value and it'll shift the tuning. And I've seen this on videos with people demonstrating the A-loop where they complain that, you know, you've, you've got to tune past the sweet spot because when you take your hand away, it's going to shift and, and you've got to get it to where it shifts back to where you want it to be. If you're hearing a dog snoring in the background, that's my friend's dog, or my friend's babysitting a dog named Sully, and he's a, a real nice lab, but I want to call him Sully Underfoot because wherever you go, he goes, and when he lays down, he snores. Sorry about that. So to get away from that hand capacitance issue, you can greatly reduce it if you use a dual ganged capacitor and you wire to the stator plates. Here's a graphic that I drew up that shows you how to wire up the capacitor to reduce the effects of hand capacitance. You wire the sides of the loop to the stator plates and then the rotator plates become just a connection point between what is now essentially two, gang, two variable capacitors in series. I don't know exactly the technical reason why this works, but it definitely works. If you set it up this way, bringing your hand in to tune the variable capacitor um, hardly affects the loop's tuning at all, if any. I, I, I haven't been able to even measure a change in the capacitance when I wire it up that way. So that's the trick. Chameleon does that with their loop. I've got a Chameleon P loop, and I noticed right away when I was messing around with it that, uh, that it stayed right where I tuned it. it. There was no shift when I brought my hand in. <coughs> so that's the trick um, to wiring it up. Of course, you have to find a variable capacitor that's two ganged capacitors, uh, and then you also have to consider the total capacitance because when you put two capacitors in series, there's a formula for calculating um, what the total capacitance is going to be. I think it's C1 times C2 divided by C1 plus C2 will give you the total capacitance. If they're matched, if they are both like 300 picofarad um, capacitors, then you can just cut them in half. You can just say, well, if they're both 300, it's going to be 150 total. If they're two different values, then you need to use the formula to figure out what your total capacitance is going to be. So you need to shoot for a capacitor that's going to be bigger than the individual sections are going to be um, at least twice what you need for your total capacitance. So that's what I wanted to say about the variable capacitors. So um, I have the basic design for my loop. I know the circumference of the outer loop. I know what range of capacitance I need to achieve the frequency range I want. Now I just have to put it all together. And that will be part two in this series where I'm going to be over at my friend Rick's lab and uh, we're going to assemble the magnetic loop and I'm going to be doing some 3D printing uh, for some of the uh, parts. So we'll see you in that video coming in a week or two. I don't know how, uh, how quick it's a little hard for me to, to uh, work right now because of what's going on, which I'm not really going to get into detail on, but um, we'll get it done. And then I'm borrowing a, a small QRP HF radio from a local ham, and we'll be able to then uh, test out the loop. So we'll see you in the next video. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. Also, if you're not already a subscriber, click to subscribe. Join us on the Facebook channel for discussion about the videos. And if you'd like to help support this channel, please click to support me on my Patreon page.